to long. Okay, well, let's just get started. So I'm just going to start with sort of a paradigm or a way, a way to think about analytics. If you could go back in time, five to 10 years, would you try to spend more time and resources helping your organization invest in and prepare for the internet? Well, the answer probably is going to be yes, of course. The value of analytics and data science will rival that of the internet. So while internet, we all know now, is very valuable and provides a lot of uh, information and value for our for all everybody, all different organizations, um, analytics is one of those things that's also going to provide just as much, if not potentially more value. And you can talk to you know academics or industry practitioners, and for the most part, people agree with me. Well, over the next five to ten years, as analytics and data science as a function becomes more and more mature, winners and losers in different industries will be a lot more apparent. And it's sort of an arms race right now of the top people within the industry who's trying to get better and better into data science and analytics. And pretty pretty soon, you know, we'll start seeing, if not already, a lot of the value and the gap between number one, number two, who are proactively investing in data science and analytics versus people who are not at all. So today we're going to talk about the four initiatives in retail and wholesale when it comes uh, and e-com excellence through data and analytics. We're going to first talk about a bit of an intro on sort of our philosophy on what analytics is, and then we'll just sort of jump right into the four initiatives. The objective really is for the participant and audience here today to learn what they can do today for their organization when it comes to leveraging data and analytics, and as well how affordable and easy it is for you to gain analytics, um, whether if it's you know learning it on your own or buying certain softwares or hiring and starting your own analytics departments. So a little bit about me, uh, why I'm presenting to you and why, why I'm qualified. So my education background, I did three degrees at Western and Ivy Business School. So I did a business degree. I did my economics degree where I focus on econometrics, economic development, as well as uh, financial economics. And I also did my master's of science in data analytics at Ivy. I started my career in analytics at PwC's analytics consulting, but soon after I started, decided to start my own company. And that was about five years ago. And we've done a ton of different analytics projects, everywhere from manufacturing, where we're working to build analytics infrastructure for big companies like Honda and Toyota, to various nonprofits. We work with Toronto General Hospital, uh, University Health, ne Health Network. We also work with a variety of different e-commerce, retail, and wholesalers. And that's why we're speaking with you today. We work with real estate companies. We also work with other uh, flea management, logistics company, and all kinds of different analytics projects. And as you'll see throughout the presentation, I am very passionate about analytics and data science and bring the value of analytics to the general public. I've been teaching statistics, analytics, and data science and economics for more than 10 years now. And I've actually taught the Masters of Analytics program at Western Ivy. I was a, I was a lecturer there. So on the less uh, professional side, a little bit more fun side, so you can get to know me, uh, I'm a big coffee uh, enthusiast. I went to Italy to learn how to make coffee. There's a picture of me on the left. Uh, on the second picture, it's me on a Yamaha R6 on a racetrack. I'm a, I enjoy riding motorcycles. Uh, the third picture, Events Analytics and Research Lab, is a company I started, and where I am very proud of the team that the team that we have and and the type of work that we do. And on the right, there's a picture of me volunteering. I'm a I'm a big advocate for um, just general philanthropy work. I uh, I try to volunteer once a week. I currently volunteer at a children's program for a women's and children's abuse shelter, domestic abuse. So Events Analytics and Research Lab. Um, just a quick background. So our philosophy, first off, we're a hybrid services and solutions analytics company. So we both have internal software and algorithms we apply to our clients, as well as we provide sort of consulting and services on a one time or on a, uh, on a recurring basis to our, our clients. 
for us, analytics and data science is not just a department, it's not just a profession, but really a mindset and problem, sol problem solving methodology. And we use it to achieve excellence, whether if it's to continuous improvements or to really make better decisions all in all for our organization. And we really do believe it should be available to everyone. And really our mission statement is democratizing analytics. So as I said, you know, what we do, analytic solutions, consulting services, and education. And we really want to provide organization the fastest and easiest way to gain full analytics capability. And our most popular sort of service that we offer sort of for, for the price of one analyst, you can get an entire specialized analytics team. So jumping right into sort of our philosophy in analytics, um, breaking it down a little bit more, and we'll keep sort of peeling back the onion as we go through this hour long, uh, well, 45 minutes webinar. So first off, there's two distinctions I wanna make right off the bat. Analytics that supports core business. So typically in a sort of industrial or um, industry analytics, you're looking at analytics that supports various functions. So you have marketing analytics, you have finance analytics, you have HR analytics and, and much more. So the analytics is supporting core business functions through a variety of ways. Uh, uh, automation and data, continuous improvements, better decision making, recurring reporting analysis, things like that. There's also analytics that is being offered as a core business. And the way we approach both of those are very different from both the methodology, methodology and technology perspective. So you could, as a retail, wholesale, e-commerce uh, provider slash platform person, provide to your own clients different analytics. And we've seen this in ways such as, hey, I'm a, I'm a retailer and customer order in, um, products from my website. I'm providing detailed analytics on, for example, uh, estimated delivery dates and you know what other analytics uh, sorry, what other products people are also buying? So sort of the recommendation engine that you will see on Amazon and things like that. There's also certain things like web application. So on your website, perhaps you're actually providing analytics for your customers so that they can you know, uh, add value or have better information when they're making their purchasing decision. And there's a lot of different creative use of that. Now, to further break down analytics in retail, wholesale, e-commerce, I'm going to look at analytics topics. I'm going to look at retail, wholesale, e-commerce topics. So typically when we look at analytics, the organization's journey looks on this sort of 10 step spectrum. So um, actually, before we jump into that, uh, Mikey, maybe just launch the poll so we can have a sort of an understanding of what everyone here is in terms of their uh, functional roles. Sure. Um, so the poll should be up now. Um, if you look at the bottom right, there's a little activities icon, this, the square triangle circle. Um, just click in there and you can answer it. I'm just gonna give everyone 20 seconds to participate. We see management, we see some marketing or management. Other. Oh, two others. Three others. <laughs> uh, for those of you who put others in the poll, maybe put on the chat uh, what business function are you in? Just taking a look. Okay, uh, while you do that, I'm gonna go through the analytics journey. So a typical journey for any organization, uh, follow these paths. Uh, an organization can have no data, so starting with very little data, and then go into data collection. Once you have data collected, you'll probably wanna do some reporting on it. You might provide ad hoc analysis. So once you have the information, hey, how come our revenue is going down. Let's dig into it. And then we have business intelligence, which is automated and more deliberate uh, business intelligence function. 
So you're looking at things like Power BI and Tableau as a tool. You might have your standalone business intelligence role and function within your team. The next three is what we call descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics. So advanced analytics, uh, descriptive, you're looking backwards, predictive, looking forward, prescriptive, what is the best course of action from a optimization and numerical standpoint? You're looking at things like simulation analysis, optimization, uh, various sort of heuristics. And then you might go into machine learning, artificial, artificial intelligence, which is you know the hottest topics today. So I know we also have another poll for this. Uh, Mikey, if you just want to launch the poll, where would you say your organization is on your analytics and analytics and data journey? So I'm going to give you, again, 30 seconds to answer that. If you scroll down, you will see it. So as you do that, just from our perspective, obviously we talk to hundreds of different organizations regarding their analytics. Most organizations are still in sort of the first third where you have you know, data collection and some ad hoc reporting. A lot of organizations today are investing heavily into business intelligence and sort of more basic data science uh, functions and roles. And in the future, we're looking at a lot more sort of automated intelligence, predictive analytics, and prescriptive analytics. So I'm just looking at the poll. Uh, we got uh, simple reporting and data collection, sort of, as I said, a lot of organizations there. And we got a couple of audience members in the events analytics stage. Very cool. OK. And as we go sort of along the analytics spectrum, we are looking at increase in ROI and sophistication on your organization's processes and efficiency. Usually when we do projects within analytics, our team looks at projects in the sort of 2 to 10x in ROI in 6 to 12 months. So certainly analytics and data science projects, when we do it, it's a lot, very much focused on adding value to the organization as well. Okay, next we have the pillars of retail and wholesale analytics. So in the sort of broad universe of retail, wholesale, and e-commerce, we're looking at these pillars, uh, customer orientation. So analytics for customers, you're looking at you know, increasing retention, looking at lifetime value. You're trying to analyze customers' purchasing behavior. You're looking at you know, what kind of products people are purchasing. For inventory, we're looking at things like understanding demand and forecasting it. Can we do inventory optimization if we know how much demand we, we are going to have? And by doing that, we can decrease stock out, increase availability, but at the same time, reduce holding costs and increasing sort of working capital availability. As well, you can sort of use inventory to understand you know, procurement, understanding lead time. Lead time, obviously, these days are, are a huge, huge topic. Um, trying to understand and predict that and when customers are going to get their products, uh, a very big topic. Product mix. So on your in your store, in your website, what is the product mix you should have? How should the website be organized? How should the physical store be organized? Uh, how should how should you look at things like cross cross selling and upselling and things like that? You can even look at things like natural language processing of your description of your product features and things like that to try to optimize the either retention or you know uh, how much time people are looking at at the product description so you know i was talking to someone else the other week and he was saying hey using analytics we were able to understand let's say we have a 60 second video on our product description website but everyone stopped watching the video after 10 seconds so maybe you should put all of your important information in the first 10 seconds, or rather improve the quality of your video all in all so that people are actually watching it for a longer period of time, right? Little things like that, um, analytics can help with, but a lot of these little things and opportunities can really add up and really distinguish the first place versus the second place and the third place. Uh, we're obviously um, really important thinking about supply chain, so understanding risk with different suppliers, trying to streamline supply chain, understanding demand pattern throughout the supply chain, 
as well if you have either internal or outsourced fleet management that's a whole topic on its own we also have things like revenue management and profitability a lot of low-hanging fruits that we see in retail wholesale e-commerce uh, is actually pricing optimization and maximization so where is your elasticity elasticity for each product can you have dynamic pricing can the prices of top products be different day-to-day -day, uh week to week different months things like that uh marketing so understanding really the holy grail for marketing at the end of the day is just understanding the roi for various channel and if you can figure out and identify which channel is performing the best versus others that as well as different promotions incentives and things like that and th those six are sort of the main topics there's also a couple other ones so i spoke about fleet management and delivery so things like um, if you have your own fleet um, what is the delivery time efficiency route optimization uh, if you have trucks then you know are you maintaining it properly and that sort of goes into equipment if you have equipment within your warehouse how much are you spending on it what is the health of each equipment how is downtime affecting uh potential downtime on different different things affecting the output of your organization and then we also have people so scheduling uh, understanding safety understanding efficiency morale uh, engagement uh, as well as uh, safety as a whole, long-term, short-term, uh, preventions, reporting, understanding root causes of safety incidents and things like that. So now we have our third and final poll on uh, which function do you think uh, all of these for your organization has the highest opportunity in terms of analytics? So we have sort of all those different pillars. If you can take another 10 seconds to vote on that. Okay, I'm just looking at the results. Uh, customer journey, I've got three votes. Product allocation, advertising. I'm guessing this might have a little bit to do with your uh, business function as, as well, where, uh, where you work. <laughs> okay, so a lot of customer journey, some advertising, product allocation. Thank you for participating. Okay, and a really interesting topic that we see as well is uh, data integration. So I'll just touch a little bit about it. I won't, I won't sort of talk as much about it later on. But analytics, uh, there's also a whole part of it called sort of data governance. Uh, and there's a really popular thing these days called data warehousing or uh, cloud storage and things like that, or center of excellence. But essentially, a lot, a lot of organizations realize they have a lot of silos within their organization when it comes to information, reporting, and data. So a big part of analytics initiatives also to combine and aggregate all the information potentially into a centralized brain. And this could potentially be just, you know, you have a dedicated function that do, just deals with data and analytics. And sometimes this is part of IT, sometimes part of management, sometimes it's part of operations, right? So it's all depending on how your organization is set up. So when it comes to, um, e-commerce, retail, and wholesale, what kind of benefits should you really aim for? So here I'm just listing some of the main ones that, that when we talk to different clients, we, we think about. So a 50% or more decrease in data and information errors, 50% uh, or more decrease in time spent on manual data and reporting tasks through automation, a more than 5% increase in customer acquisition, retention of loyalty through personalized messaging, services, or recommendations, a greater than 5% increase in revenue through pricing optimization, a greater than 5% increase in ROI and marketing through spend allocation or even you know, product allocation, more accurate inventory optimization and sales forecasts, which leads to you know, um, more than 5% increase in revenue through lower stockouts and better availability, and a more than 5% increase in working capital availabilities. Obviously, these are sort of quite generalized. It really depends organization to organization where the low-hanging fruits are. 
But if you just take a moment and think about, hey, like for my organization, of all these different values, where are we sort of a little bit behind and where do you think a lot of opportunities might be? That may be a useful exercise. How do you find value when you don't have a use case? Well, number one is just increasing sophistication for employees, right? And often, you know, things like this will happen. So employees will say, hey, I don't really know what happened to, hmm, I think this is what happened to, hey, I know this happens X percentage of time to, hey, I know X percentage of time. If I do this, the outcome will be this, right? So you're really going from, you know, um, lack of information and certainty to really understanding what your universe and your decision sets are. Automation, uh, getting more real time. So going from monthly reporting to weekly reporting to daily reporting to even hourly in information, it'll give you better and faster reaction as well as feedback, as well more time. So automating uh, repetitive tasks helps you get time back. Finally, reactive versus proactive. So some problems you can try to solve before they happen and the rest you can prepare for. So I just want to go through really quick two use cases uh, that we've actually worked on. So we had an e-commerce retailer. They have uh, inventory procurement that they're really just doing on the Excel sheet. So they have a few thousand actually SKUs that they're selling on different e-commerce platforms and websites. They wanted to stop uh, and actually try to understand how much money and revenue are they losing by not having inventory at the right time at the right place. So we created a sort of a feedback loop as well as an inventory optimization system using a fairly simple sort of methodology called the EOQ, economic order quantity, and then sort of building on top of that along with uh, AI forecasting. So we use a machine learning forecasting to create sort of a real time dashboard so that people can say, hey, I go on a dashboard. I know here are the top 10 SKUs I have to look at this week because they're either going to run out of time over the next eight weeks or, hey, it's already too late. I really need to increase my spend or increase the shipment speed for this supplier right here. We're able to successfully sort of help them reduce costs and streamline, first off, the procurement and inventory optimization functional process, but also help them decrease stockout and increase revenue. We also help them build a sort of pricing optimization system that's dynamic, day-to-day uh, -day dynamic pricing system, and really help them increase their revenue by sort of more than 10%. We have a, another organization that we work with. This is an industrial wholesaler that, again, has more than, I think it was like 3,000 SKUs. Uh, we help them primarily with pricing, but also along with pricing, there's also inventory optimization. We use... Uh, OLS regression to understand elasticity. So of all the SKUs they have, understanding segmentation through the product side, as well as the supplier side, as well as the customer side, hey, this group of products is selling really, really well and people are buying it on a very frequent basis. Is there an opportunity to either increase price on it because people are buying it regardless and it's a non-commodity item? Or is there an opportunity where you can reach out to your top 20 biggest clients and say, hey, because you are our top 20 biggest clients, let me give you a little discount. Maybe, or if, you, if you're if you able to buy more from us, we can give you a, a little bulk, bulk discount and things like that. Uh, and um, you know, ultimately we're able to help them identify opportunities and help improve profitability by more than 5%. So now going to sort of the four initiatives we're going to talk about strategy, tracking, culture, and adoption execution. So first off, strategy. If you don't have a data analytics strategy, really, it's it's time to build one. And there's a couple of ways of doing that. Uh, first off, bottom up, sort of a gap analysis. You're taking a inventory or stock of what systems you have. Are you is it currently being adopted well? Is there a potential for you to push that system a little bit more? Where do you want to go in the next year with that system? Can you, is, there, is there a way to add value? Is there continuous improvement opportunities? So some quick assumption checks. First off, you have to recognize data analytics, something that requires multiple disciplines. It requires management. It requires a subject matter expert, potentially requires IT. 
and it requires people with analytics and data science know-how. Understanding that dashboarding BI is not enough as well. If you just have simple reporting, that's definitely not enough. We are in sort of a very fast paced stage right now where analytics and data is coming in faster and faster and customers are demanding more and more when it comes to personalization and understanding of their needs and things like that. Now having a plan, definitely not acceptable. It could be as simple as it doesn't need to be like a 30 page strategy document. It could be as simple as here's one page. Here's what data we have. Here's what analytics we're currently using. Here's where we want to go in the next year. Here are one or two projects we can, we can work on as a team. Your competitor certainly is working on it. All of you are here today because you want to get better in analytics and data science. It's definitely affordable, right? Uh, all the software out there, it's $10, $20 a month. Uh, you could train your employees. Um, there is very simple way of doing it all the way on to more you know, intense. You're spending $100,000. You're spending a million dollars a year on your analytics uh, team and investments. And certainly, we see a lot of medium and larger organization and enterprise spending that kind of investment. And we're really trying to push the smaller medium sized organization to uh, improve their capabilities as well. You certainly needed to stay competitive. And obviously, because we always say analytics projects are ROI projects, it's supposed to drive new value to your organization. Now, another way to look at analytics strategy, so you're looking at a top down. So what are your main object objectives? How are you currently tracking those objectives? How are you tracking your most important activities? How often are you reviewing those numbers? Can you go from monthly to weekly? And what process of improving your process are you currently implementing? Is there a way to revolutionize and make incremental improvements on your most important activities? Here are just sort of a index on to help you build your analytics strategy. So you can sort of think about it from a data and analytics perspective and in the human perspective. So on a data perspective, how are you collecting, storing, and using it? Obviously, security and privacy is really important. Analytics, um, figure out where your low-hanging fruits are, building a roadmap for the next 12 months, and understanding what projects to value, understanding the costs and what benefit you'll bring to your organization. There's, I promise you, there's a large pool of opportunity for your, uh, for your organization. Do you know what they are? Can you think outside the box and think about how your competitors might be doing it and how can you beat them on that? Finally, uh, analytics again, I think I touched on this earlier. The people aspect is really, really important. It certainly needs to be, analytics certainly needs to be supported by management as well as department heads. But then there's also sort of your analytics team. It doesn't need to be a standalone analytics team. It could be, um, it could be analytics team that you have for each of your different business functions. You could have an analytics person for your marketing team. You could have an analytics person for your operations, for your warehousing, for your inventory optimization, things like that. Balancing defensive, defensive and offensive uh, analytics strategy. So analytics and data, you can be defensive. You're more for focusing on security privacy, focusing more on the organizational uh organization of your information whereas offensive you're more proactive and creative creatively using your information and actively looking for opportunities there's a really cool link here um that i like about you know what how how analytics strategies are are being looked at from uh, harvard business review there's also sort of passive versus active analytics, a little bit different than defensive and offensive. So passive, you're using data when it's needed. And most organizations probably are fairly passive. You're using org information when, when you need it. You're pulling transaction information. You're looking at customers. You're only really using your information when there's a problem, but generally ignoring it when everything is fine. Whereas active, you're looking for opportunities to do better in your data and information. You're looking to reduce waste and efficiency, and you're thinking of new ideas to bring value to your clients and customers. Most organizations are too passive and defensive with their data and analytics. Let's change that. We should be a lot more aggressive and more offensive 
when it comes to using your information, it's literally a treasure trove of value that you can bring to your organization. All you got to do is start mining it. And if that doesn't convince you enough, there's this chart that I like to use. Um, as we know, technology grows at an exponential pace. We have all these data and information and technology out there that is disrupting industries. So as technology grows at sort of Moore's law, so every two years it's doubling its effectiveness or having its costs. Organization that's proactively investing technology data and analytics is going to sort of trail behind that. Organization that's passively investing in data and analytics is going to trail behind that. An organization that's not investing at all is going to trail behind that. But as you can see, because it's a exponential curve, not a linear curve, if you look at any vertical, the gap between the organization is just getting bigger and bigger. And that's going to be a problem. You definitely want to be, if not cutting edge, trying to, trying to stay on top of technology and data science for your organization. So just to recap, what does analytics do for management? It provides information on blind spots, helps deal with problems proactively, helps you find key levers to drive bottom line. That's not obvious without deep pattern recognition. Helps you cut down time through automation and really helps you be more creative and ask better and more important questions. And a lot of these patterns really just can be recognized by looking at top line and service line numbers. You have to dig pretty deep to find those information and nuggets of treasure. So number two uh, initiatives, uh, tracking, tracking. So when it comes to tracking and KPIs, I like to use this sort of system and design thinking. So really simplified, almost all of your activities within your organization are either linear or circular. And so I'll just explain that a little bit. So linear, you have information coming in or a product coming into your warehouse. Some processing happens and then some products going out. Uh, it could be production lines. It could be accounting systems. It could be management systems, right? You have input, something happens, output. And then we also have circular, which is more of a feedback loop. loop. So as an example, let's say we have quality assurance. Uh, the quality assurance looks at a problem area, suggests a program or a change in standard operating procedure. Something else happens, and then sorry, no, uh, and you run it, you test it, uh, you you collect the results, you look at the results, and then you make more changes. So that's a feedback loop. But certainly, every steps, process, activity, every step has input and output. And a lot of the time, organizations are only measuring output, and they will say things like, "Hey, our organization sometimes a little bit of black box. I don't really know what's happening in between." what is the exact cost, right? I don't know how much time it's costing me to ship to US versus Canada. We sort of just do it all in one, one shot within, within the team, things like that. So certainly starting with output is the fundamental. Then you gotta start breaking down the input and the process and how you're breaking there. Are you, ever, are you able to measure cost and efficiency of the stuff in the middle? Are you able to measure cost and efficiency of the input as well? There is also recognizing a lot of different ways to measure the same thing. Sometimes different company in the exact same industry will measure the same thing differently. Sometimes different departments within an organization will measure different things differently. It's not saying, you know, one way is wrong or the other way is wrong or right. People have different perspectives and there's reasons why they measure certain things in different ways. And it's really important, especially if you're in management or, or have a higher level of view of things to try to understand that. Now, the typical progression of your KPI reporting, I'm going to say this sort of five steps here. You have high level tracking. So most organizations are probably here. You're tracking deliveries. You're tracking your customer's lifetime value. You're tracking your inventory levels and days. The more granular you can get, the better. You're reporting on it on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis, on a daily basis. You're looking at trends, month to month trends, week to week trends. You're diving deeper. You're trying to analyze things so, so you can do better or understanding problem areas. You can start aggregating in this third step, your information. So you can aggregate your transaction information with your accounting information, with your inventory information, with your warehouse information, right? You can start adding all of them together. 
And if management is able to get a holistic view, dissecting it down into different product lines, different customer segments and things like that, that's very, very powerful because you're understanding nuances and granularity. You won't be able to see just by looking at your top down, top level revenue information or cost information. Once you have that, you're looking at proactive use of analytics. You're actively trying to say, hey, uh, you know, our, our revenue is down in November compared this year compared to last year. Why is that? Which segment is it down? Which product line is it down? Is your uh, marketing channel that's causing that, right? Getting into sort of deeper dive one-time analysis. Then you have actual integration of intelligence within your processes that's automated. So as teams get more sophisticated, you're starting to integrate, you know, more predictive and optimization with you, your day-to-day -day processes. So just to give an example on that, um, let's say you're measuring on a level one, you're understanding your customer uh, retention and your customer lifetime value. Okay, you're collecting the information. Now you're reporting it on number two. You're reporting it. So you're saying, okay, what is the number of users that's coming into our stores or our website? Is that increasing or decreasing? Number three, hey, we have our customer information. Can we merge that with their transaction information? Can we merge that with our social media information? Are you able to say, hey, this customer goes from um, you know, our Facebook, they click on the ad, they go into our website, and then now they're they're purchasing. And now they're they're being with us for 10 years or five years or whatever. Can we can we have that? you know, the buzzword, the 360 uh, customer view or the sort of the omni-channel view. Then you go into proactive use of analytics. Hey, I'm noticing certain patterns within our customers. Of all the customers that's, you know, uh, high frequency and high monetary within our, within our storefront, are we able to give them some sort of new incentives, give them personalized uh, discounts? Hey, I notice you come in every, every week, every month, Here's a loyalty point, whatever, things like that. And then finally, we have sort of advanced AI data science and analytics that's integrated into your system. So let's say you're reporting for customer segmentation, you're measuring historical things. So this year, November versus last year, November. But then what if you can have AI and prediction that says, hey, you should really look at this segment right here. Based off of our prediction, it looks like it might have a problem in the next six to eight weeks, right? So it could be, let's say, uh, supply chain problems. Um, let's say this product line is selling faster and faster and faster. Our historical lead time is eight weeks. And I think we're gonna sell all of this product within six weeks. Then you're gonna have two weeks of no sales, right? So if you're then start going to forward looking, that's really, really powerful. Culture, super important. So I'm gonna use sort of uh, two examples to talk about culture. So what is a really good team and excellent team when it comes to data and analytics and what is a okay team? So number one, uh, I've been doing the same way for 20 years. Uh, there's no data and analytics strategy. There's poor tracking on your activities. There's unstructured and unorganized reporting. There's a bunch of spreadsheets or data or systems spread in multiple locations and stakeholders. There's redundancies. There's no process for continuous improvements, no learning or development, and no sort of mandate from management to invest in innovation or technology, or no dedicated team for personal per, or personnel for intelligence. And an excellent analytics team has a defined, it often has a defined data and analytics strategy. It's driven to be the best in class and has an innovative and experimental mindset. And management's okay if we experiment, things doesn't work out. That's part of innovation. There's ways to track performance indicators. There's structured reporting that supports strategy. There's systems or databases, or even just really organized Excel libraries in your folder systems, right? Just having a, something that's organized versus not really, really important. And there's a defined process for continuous improvement and a defined analytics team. Okay, now we're looking at OK versus really successful analytics project. So we've done a lot of projects, and here's just sort of, sort of the patterns we've seen. So in the OK project, you're looking at tools that's built one-off and not really ROI-driven. It has a low adoption due to misalignment of process, P, 
people and strategy, and there's skepticism within organization on the usefulness of data and analytics. In a su successful implementation, a team wants to be best in class. It's open to explore outside the norm. You're integrating tools for the whole system. There's cross-discipline teams, and you're using analytics to change economics and business model and not the technology itself. So that last point is really important. The really, really successful project we see is analytics and data science and technology project that fundamentally change how an organization look at a sort of a traditional business process. So we have, as an example, um, a traditional way of looking at pricing. A lot of time, you know, a, a team or a management team will look at uh, prices of your product mix every six months and you're just going through it, it's like, hey, this product's selling really well, or hey, there's a low supply for this product that's increased the price. Versus, hey, we have an entire tool and system that does pricing optimization on a week to week basis. That's so powerful and you can in really increase and fine tune pricing optimization and revenue optimization and profitability optimization by using a technology tool like that. And it will fundamentally change how every process in your organization works just from leveraging that tool as an example. Education is a low hanging fruit. For non-technical people, really you can learn fundamentals of BI, so like Tableau, Power BI, Click, um, a bunch of other tools out there in two to four hours. These tools are really, really affordable from 10 to $20 a, uh, a month. You can learn the basics of R and data science in maybe eight hours, the, the fundamentals. And if you don't know Excel, well, you should really know how to use Excel. But ultimately, never stop learning. Technology is moving so fast. Understanding the fundamental and structures of analytics and data science will help speed up learning exponentially. Really, if you have if your career within if your career still has, you know, 20, 30, well, even 10, 20, 30 years left, you should really learn data science and analytics because that's really the future. And you, you know, I don't think any any management team would, would doubt that. Finally, adoption execution. So I saw this graph from sort of a business management textbook. It's called a five star model, but the value of data analytics directly correlates to how well you can communicate and implement change. So in this five star model, to to get really good with your analytics, it's not just the technology, but the people has to be adopted. Your company structure has to be in the right, correct way that aligns. Your, your objectives is aligned. Your process is being updated. Your systems, you know, uh, being continuously improved on. You really have to get buy-in and align with organization goal and strategy for analytics to really have its full potential. Typical process flow in analytics lifecycle. So Usually start off with discovery, and this is sort of an agile collaborative learning exercise. You do discovery, you try to understand, okay, here are some problems we have within the organization. Here's how analytics might apply. You're presenting the information, you're making a decision. You start developing and experimenting on those tools. You're implementing those tools, you're creating a recommendation, and then potentially if it's a productionized system, there is a support and maintenance involved. Okay, finally, I'll just talk a little bit about common pitfalls and how to avoid them. First one, a BI tool is built, but no one's using it. A, make sure the tool is built with a problem in mind and that it's actually integrated into a standard activity. Those standard activities are there for a reason. If you can make it more streamlined, then it's a lot higher likelihood that your BI initiative will have a success. Number two, uh, decisions are made and then analysis are made to justify. So I don't, I don't know how many of you have this experience where your boss might say, hey, uh, I wanna do this uh, with our uh, advertising spend. I think this is what we should do. Can you just run some analysis to help me support that decision? Well, and that's sort of a backward looking thing, right? Analytics is supposed to help you be objective with the information. So certainly if you're a data analyst or you're trying to present the information, be as objective and unbiased as possible and recognizing what biases you might have and point out points of consideration or counter or um, you know pros and cons of different arguments. Over-engineering. So 
most business problems are actually pretty simple to solve from a sort of one-to-one -one perspective. There's no need to, and this is sort of a joke, there's no need to build an optimized simulation model with stochastic forecast. Start simple, build a framework, and then you can add on complexity uh, if you really lay out the foundation correctly. Uh, and then there's a lack of understanding in data sense and analytics as a function. Sometimes people almost look at it like, like, um, like magic, right? How, how could analytics provide an outlook on the future that's 99% accurate? That's impossible, right? Uh, so certainly engage in cross-education, training, and collaboration, being able to have a conversation and recognize the importance of understanding in analytics from top to bottom. So before I close off and open things up for Q&A, I'm just going to have a, a, a quick sort of summary. So. Events Analytics and Research Lab, we really are here to help organization from small to big with analytics projects. We do analytics services and solutions from a few hundred dollars a month to tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. But certainly, you know, depending on where your problem sets and opportunities are, we help, uh, help you with them. We want to provide affordable analytics Please help us, follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, tell your coworkers. If you know anyone that may be interested in analytics, we're always happy to chat, both myself and uh, Michael, who's on the call. Um, and if you're in GTA Toronto, um, we'd love to you know, grab a coffee with you. So with that, I'll close off and do a quick Q&A. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I know there was one question um, from Manny earlier in the uh, in the presentation. Um, Manny asked, "What's the benefit? What's the main benefits for D 2 C brands with a Shopify website when the platform already provides analytics? Um, also, in relation to social media, how could this service help with UX or product development versus the native analytic tools?" For example, social analytics, Sprout analytics, Shopify analytics, Google analytics. Thanks, Michael. Hey, man. Thanks for the question. So that's a uh, that's a really interesting thing, right? A lot of time we actually get that quite a bit. Um, you know, we talk to people and say, "Hey, like, you know, what are you doing with your analytics?" And they say, "Yeah, we already have analytics. We have Google Analytics. Our system provides reporting that we can use. We have lots of analytics in all these different systems. The problem is, you know, we can't really aggregate them or actually have time to look at them, right? So I think really two things. One is um, analytics, just because the information is there, a lot of time organization are, are not proactive enough to actually dig into it and actually leverage the information and mine the information. And we hear this obviously all the time, everybody's really busy. Um, there's a lot of challenges and day-to-day -day problems you gotta deal with, but how do you get away from the day-to-day -day challenge and think strategically and think innovative, innovatively so that you can bring the you know better decision-making or better uh, build, build out better sort of analytics products for the end user, whether if it's internal or external. Uh, the other thing is um, typical sort of business analysts or management team, they're usually focusing on sort of business challenges and they're looking at, because they have a lot of things to do, they're looking at top line information. Analytics data science, when you get into the more advanced phases, you're looking at a lot more granular things and you're digging into it, things that could take weeks, months to actually analyze. And you're potentially building models to automate your, your processes and things like that. So there's certainly a lot of benefits. Um, just even, even if you have analytics reporting within your systems, there's still a lot of benefits that a lot of traditional businesses are unable to see. But if your organization already does that, then it's great, right? <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Um, Ali asked where you could get the uh, recording for the meeting. So I did wanna say that I'm gonna clean up the video and post on YouTube, and then I'll make sure to send it over to um, the emails that you guys all signed up with. Um, and then we have another question.
how do you ensure that the management as well as employees um, who execute align with the analytics strategy? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Certainly, as I mentioned in the slide, is it is very, very important to have alignment. So two things. One is it's kind of cliche, but communication, right? So if you're having an analytics initiative, understanding it is a cross-discipline team, and you have to make sure you're pulling the right stakeholders together, right? So let's say you're you're an analytics person within an organization and your boss who is the ceo tells you hey please go and understand uh our advertising roi and provide me with reporting and analytics and some recommendation on how we can do better right fairly standard ask if you just like pull the information and analyze it on your own and give a report that's not going to be effective you have to make sure you're talking to the the people in the marketing team if there's an outsourced team that also provides aspen uh, ad spend allocation, things like that, or advertising design team that, that is helping the organization think about branding and design. You have to make sure you talk to all of them because there are a lot of then deeper questions you got to think about. And you also can really implement your recommendations if you don't involve the advertising team. And then the other thing I do want to say is um, you really can't get deep enough if um, your your organization is, is silo when it comes to analytics. And there's a lot of different ways you can think about that. Um, so when it comes to the teams, there's like centralized team versus decentralized team versus federated teams or sort of a hybrid approach. So centralized team, you have sort of a, a analytics team that everybody comes to and they're sort of like consultants. A decentralized team is like each individual department will have their own analytics individual that they help. So marketing analytics person, uh, inventory optimization analytics person. And there's a hybrid where it's like, sort of like an in-between where you, there's a centralized team, but then they loan out people to the different departments. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think we still got a few people on here and we got a question. Um, what percent of consulting firm RL is dedicated towards advanced analytics, such as forecasting sales and category optimization? If yes, when and what tools do you use to carry out these processes? Yeah, um, I mean, it really depends because it depends on what kind of client work we're, we're, we're doing at the time. I would say majority of the time, sort of more than 50% were working on events analytics. So like optimization, forecasting, building probabilistic models for nonprofits, um, pricing optimization systems, things like that. But also understanding in order to build those tools, you have to have the systems and data in a certain structure that's clean so that the data scientists can actually do that. So sometimes we will have to do that cleanup. And the typical things you hear is, you know, 80% of a data science project, you're actually setting up the data and the structure itself. And there are certain times where we're actually working on like bigger, like data governance project. So we're doing a really big project with an auto manufacturer. They have three factories here and um, we're helping them build a data governance. So we're pulling all the data together into a centralized location. We're building daily automation and reporting that does that. So quite mixed, depending on the project we are working on. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Steek asked when oh. we are going to get the YouTube video up. Um, should be, I'll try and get it up later today even um, and send the link to you guys. Thanks, Michael. Sorry, I just forgot the second part of that question. So what tools we use? So typically we work with whatever our client is comfortable. We're fairly tool agnostic. So every organization have different databases, even the same organization, like even like, let's say people who uses Shopify or Amazon or Home Depot, whatever. They all have like the standard tool that they have, which is um, platform dependent, but then they'll all use different tools and they'll all use the tools a little bit differently. 
So even if it's the same database, a lot of times we're actually having to work with that database in a different way. So it's not like a copy and paste. When it comes to BI tools, typically we're using Power BI or Tableau or Click. Again, depends on the preference of the clients, whether they have already Microsoft, Azure services, or if they are a Tableau shop or a Click shop. On the events analytics side, again, depends on the tool, but if we're doing custom coding, we're doing it either on uh, Python or R, and there's a lot of tools within that. And there's also like more sort of specialized tools that we might use depending on the scenario, things like um, TensorFlow and H2O for um, machine learning optimization. Great, thank you. Um, and, oh yeah, so yeah, um, another question about how we can connect for further conversations. Yeah, I have um, all your guys' emails and I'll send a follow-up after if you have any more personal questions um, about your company or what you're working on. I'm sure Eric and I would love to meet, uh, hear about kind of your challenges, see if we can solve them and just have a conversation. So definitely open to that. Thanks. Um, is there anyone else who might uh, have a question or? Uh, I sign up for Eventbrite. Do I have to sign up another way? Nope. If you're on Eventbrite, no. uh, we, that was the main way we, we were able to communicate with you. Thank you. Yeah, I should have your email already via Eventbrite. Awesome. Okay. Or, uh, well, we can probably stop the recording. I'll stay back maybe five, 10 minutes if anyone just want to chat. This is like the social part of it. If anyone have a cup of coffee, we can, we can have a quick chat, ask questions.